Uh, well, welcome everybody uh, here and online uh, to an extension of our sleep week where we are attempting to change the culture of sleep at Google uh, through information and uh, wonderful guest speakers such as Dr. Mir Krieger here. Um, I did my PhD in sleep and circadian genetics at Northwestern and uh, Mir literally wrote the book that uh, anyone would uh, start out with. Uh, so as close as we have to a sleep Bible, um, uh, Mir, Mir actually wrote that. Uh, so he has uh, brought together uh, more sleep scientists in sort of one compendium and, and probably in one place than anyone I know. And he uh, has graciously spent time over the last couple of years, I believe, writing a, uh, uh, a similar type book, but for, for everyone uh, that's not necessarily a scientist. And so I will let him tell you about that right now. Okay, so uh, before telling you about my book, I want to sort of introduce myself. I'm a professor of medicine at Yale University, and I've been involved in sleep for, believe it or not, uh, more than 40 years. So I was, I've been involved in sleep longer than some of you have been alive on this planet. So I've always been really interested in sleep, and what I'm going to talk about today is what everybody needs to know about sleep. I'm not going to try to turn you into a doctor or anything, but I'm going to want you to be able to understand that if you or somebody in your family has a sleep problem, that you know how to think about it and, and so forth. So I'm going to begin, as we often do in medicine, with a case. And in the, the case um, is, is a, a, a tired elected official, a 55-year-old elected official, eight-year history of late-night meetings, uh, meals, pizza, and soft drinks in the middle of the night for years would phone cabinet members in the middle of the night, his performance at work plummeted, and he started to exhibit very poor judgment. And I'm not talking about Mr. Trump. <laughs> okay, so um, this is a picture of the guy. Does anybody recognize the guy? Any, any guesses? Uh, I, I hear, I see people. A beg your pardon? Clinton was famous for pizza and fast food in the White House. Okay, so. Uh, you are right. So this is taken from Newsweek 2001. And those of you who are old enough to remember uh, when Clinton left in his last week in office, he pardoned a whole bunch of people who should never have been pardoned. And it caused a lot of controversy. And this is taken from Newsweek at that time. Some close to Clinton say he knew perfectly well that some of the pardons might cause a stir and went ahead anyway. Others believe that Clinton up all night, day after day, wasn't thinking clearly. Over the years, Clinton had tried to convince himself he could get by just fine on a few hours of sleep a night. Time and again, he proved himself wrong. Struggling to extricate himself from a previous scandal, Clinton once told a friend, every important mistake I've made in my life, I've made because I was too tired. And this was uh, an important sort of theme of his presidency. He was a tired president. So, um, so what is the real problem? I mean, Clinton is obviously a smart guy. You know, he, he was the president of the United States. But his real problem was one of ignorance. And I'm not using this in a pejorative way. He simply didn't know. He simply didn't know the, the importance of sleep deprivation. So the public in general does not know the negative impact of sleep deprivation on the brain and on performance. So I'm going to give you another case now. Uh, this is a 29-year-old new mother. Uh, she was a female. Uh, she was an executive secretary, a 10-year history of excessive daytime sleepiness, in other words, being sleepy during the day at a time when she shouldn't have been sleepy. She had a 20-year history of snoring and five years of apnea, which means stopping breathing, uh, that was observed by others. And uh, so I'm going to go back again for why she saw me. So her sleepiness had been severe for about five years. And the problem with her was she was unable to stay awake during the daytime. And she had a new baby at home. And she could not take care of the new baby. So um, that was the problem. So her symptoms during the pregnancy, they worsened and worsened. When the baby was born, it was, it was on the small side, only about five and a half pounds. She'd had two previous miscarriages, and I'll come back to that a little bit later. And when she told her doctor about her symptoms during pregnancy, 
he told her not to do anything because it was too dangerous to treat sleep apnea during pregnancy. So basically what she did when she slept is Okay, so she made noise, then became quiet, and then started breathing again. And she did this the entire night, and in fact, did this every night. So what was the problem with the doctors taking care of her? Again, it was one of ignorance. Her doctor should have known that she had a, a, a life-threatening condition that could affect both her and her, and, and her baby. And, and again, it was really a matter of, of ignorance. So the public is generally doesn't know enough about sleep. And the same thing is true, by the way, for doctors. The average doctor um, who graduates from a medical school is lucky if he or she gets even one or two hours of sleep in all four years of medical school. So the average doctor really doesn't know a lot about sleep. So what we're going to do today in the next uh, I'm going to say 30 minutes, is we're going to review what everyone should know about sleep. And we're going to look at what is normal, what is abnormal, and if there's a problem, what you can do about it. So here's what you're going to learn. You're going to learn about the importance and benefits of sleep. You're going to learn a little bit about sleep stages, in other words, the depth of sleep. Uh, you're going to learn something about how much sleep do you as an individual need. And uh, then we're going to talk about sleep deprivation. And chances are that many of you in this room are sleep deprived for one reason or another, be it work, be it lifestyle, be it you have a disorder that actually interferes with your sleep. And then I'm going to very briefly cover the main sleep conditions that we see in a sleep clinic. So one of the things that we learned about 20 or 30 years ago is that if you don't sleep, you die. And this was a research that was done in animals, in, in rodents. And a rodent that is sleep deprived completely will eventually die. And they die what I would call a metabolic death. In other words, they lose weight, they eat a lot, their fur uh, falls out, and they get sores all over their body. And that's what happens. And it probably does happen in people. And there aren't a lot of examples that I can give you this was one that was in the media about two or three years ago. Um, this was a story of this uh, gentleman, um, Moritz Erhard, who was an intern working for Bank of America. And he was found dead after being awake for three consecutive uh, days. Uh, didn't sleep at all. And there was a lot of controversy um, about this because in the banking industry, the, there's a whole lot of sleep deprivation, people working crazy hours, very long periods of, of not sleeping. So this is an example of someone where there was no other explanation for, for his death. So why is sleep important? It's as necessary as the water we drink, the air we breathe, and the food we eat to function and live at our best. And it's the key to health, performance, safety, it's very important for safety, and, and I'll come back to that later, and also for quality of life. So you might ask yourself, um, how does the body know how much sleep it needs? And, and how does it do that? Well, there are, uh, so sleep is controlled by two separate systems. And one system I'm calling here the sleep-wake restorative process. It balances sleep and wakefulness. What that means is the longer you're awake, the more sleepy you become. So if you've been awake for 16 hours, you're going to be sleepy. If you've been awake for 18 hours, you're going to be really sleepy. 20 hours, you'll have, you'll have to fight to actually stay awake. And that corresponds to an increase in, in your brain uh, uh, of a chemical called adenosine. And uh, adenosine is like a marker of sleep deprivation. Now, does anybody in this room use an adenosine blocker for their health? OK, how many of you had a cup of coffee this morning? OK, so caffeine is an adenosine blocker. And the reason why caffeine works in waking you up is because it's effect on adenosine. So the other thing that controls the timing of sleep is a circadian biological clock. So inside our brains, we have a clock that actually keeps track of time. 
and it regulates the timing of sleep and wakefulness. And as a result of, of these two things acting together, we have um, alertness, which varies over the 24-hour day. So, in the, so here we have high alertness, low alertness, 9 o'clock in the morning. Most of us should be wide awake and alert. And around now, many of you are going to be tired. You're going to have what's called a mid-afternoon dip. And it doesn't matter whether you've eaten or not. This is a function of your circadian clock. Then you're going to be much more awake. And then suddenly, at the, at the end of the, of the evening, you're suddenly going to fall asleep. Uh, you're going to lose alertness. And then th the day begins again. So that's how sleep is regulated, two different systems. One depends on how much you slept, and the other one depends on your biological clock. So where is this mysterious clock? So this mysterious clock is found right in the middle of the brain. This is a cross section, meaning a slice of the, of the head. And it's, it's right here. It's a suprachiasmatic nucleus. It's a group of cells that are in the middle of, of the brain. And these cells have a pacemaker function. One can take these cells and put them into another animal, and we could find that uh, th that, that animal is going to have the rhythm of, of the, the donor animal, if you will. So it resides in the brain. Now, how does it know? How does something in the middle of the brain know what time it is, right? So the way it knows what time it is, it's affected by light and dark. So we have sensors in the eye, uh, certain types of cells that are very sensitive to sunlight, actually to light in general, not just sunlight. And they send information to the suprachiasmatic nucleus and basically synchronizes it. So every time you wake up in the morning and you're, you're exposed to light, you're actually synchronizing your circadian clock. And so this is something that we've known about for a very long period of time. So it turns out that not only does the brain or the cells in the brain have a built-in clock, so does every single cell of your body. Every cell of your body has the genetic information in it to actually have a clock function. And so all cells have a biologic rhythm. So the liver at night doesn't work the same way as the liver during the daytime, although I'm sure you've never really thought about how the liver works. Um, now, how the master clock in the brain controls all the others is still a mystery. In other words, all the clocks are synchronized. Your liver knows whether it's, whether it's day or night. So we don't really know about all the connections. And it certainly isn't via sort of an in-body internet, but who knows what they'll discover one day. So what happens if these clocks break? So this is a colleague of mine. Uh, you know him. This, this is Fred Turek, uh, who worked with uh, the gentleman who introduced me. Yeah, and, and so look, um, this is a mouse. This is a rodent that has a mutant circadian clock. It becomes obese. It develops the, feature, uh, the features of diabetes. And these two um, um, rodents are actually twins. I guess there were a bunch of them, so I, I don't know what you call two of a, of a group of a whole bunch of them. So, um, so we know that, that, there's, uh, that if you have a mutant clock, you become very abnormal. And there are many conditions that can cause your clock to either become confused, and I'll talk about those a little bit later, or to malfunction. So normally, when we go to sleep, we don't just go from being awake to being asleep. There's a pattern that has been recognized for many, many years. So when we go to bed, uh, we're awake for a while, usually between uh, 5 and 10 or 20 minutes. And we then have a very orderly progression during the, what, the different stages or depths of sleep. And the deepest ones are down here, stages 3 and 4 which we call deep sleep. And they occur mostly at the very beginning of the night, in, in, in the first third of the night. Like magic, uh, we have, after about 90 minutes of being asleep, we go into what's called rapid eye movement sleep. And rapid eye movement sleep is, is a very, very interesting phase, uh, because this is when we dream. 
And we're also paralyzed during rapid eye movement sleep, which means we cannot res respond physically to what we're actually dreaming. And uh, you'll see a little bit later, there are some diseases where, um, where someone, um, for example, um, has an abnormality in the system that paralyzes you that results in, in, in the person acting out their dreams and they can harm their bed partner. So we have the first episode of, of dreaming of about 90 minutes. And then we have it. thereafter, about every 90 uh, minutes, another episode of rapid eye movement sleep or dreaming. Okay, so all of us will, will dream on the average between three and five times a night. Most people, if they're lucky, will remember one dream. Many people do not remember any of their dreams. And in part, that depends on whether or not they've awakened during a dream or in proximity in time uh, to a dream. So we need consolidated sleep. And what I mean by consolidated is the long stretches of sleep, um, and, and which we think is very restorative for all these reasons, for safety, um, cognitive function. If, if you don't sleep enough, your cognitive function uh, quickly becomes abnormal. Uh, relating well to others, um, you can almost always recognize someone who's sleep deprived they're snappy, they're irritable, you don't want to be around them. And it turns out that learning and memory consolidation are really important um, uh, uh, in, in, in terms of the function of sleep. And, it, and to put it into a context that you, you as engineers mostly will understand, what happens during sleep is the, is, is the RAM, the memory in RAM is put on to a hard drive. In other words, the, the volatile memory is stored permanently. And so that's what happens during sleep, particularly during rapid eye movement sleep. And there are many health problems that arise in someone who doesn't sleep enough or properly. So how much sleep do you need? Okay, so every, most of you are gonna be in this group here. You're gonna need between seven and nine hours. And the range goes from about six to about 11. Uh, some people will need 12, as you'll see um, in a minute. How many people here sleep less than, on the average, less than seven hours? Okay, so it looks like about 25% of you. So um, we did a survey among uh, students at, at Yale at a sleep fair about a year ago, and probably about 25 or 30% of the students were actually sleeping uh, less than seven hours, and there were quite a few who were sleeping less than five hours. So, um, so it's, a, it's, it's, it's a huge problem. I said the word huge, and so here we have uh, the current president of the United States, and sleep needs vary. So this is an actual quote. This is an actual qu quote. How does someone that's sleeping 12 and 14 hours a day compete with someone that's sleeping three or four. He admitted to only sleeping three or four hours. And to people in, 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 the, um, in the sleep field, this was an extremely scary statement because if you've studied sleep, uh, three to four hours of sleep is scary. And so um, athletes, okay, so tell that to LeBron James and a lot of other athletes. So LeBron James sleeps 12 hours a day, and there are many other athletes that sleep a great deal, way more than what I showed you in terms of recommendation. And you might ask yourself the question, what advantage does an athlete have in sleeping more, right? So when, when you're looking at a world-class athlete, everybody at that kind of level is physically the same. They're all in great shape, and they're all strong, and they're all quick. The difference is in the brain. And, and that's, what the, that's where the difference um, resides. And so um, sleep for athletes is critically important. It's critically important for airline pilots. It's critically important for the people that sit in the Google autonomous vehicles watching the car do its thing. Okay, so, so being awake is very important. So people in general in the US society are not getting sufficient sleep and about 40% of the population are not getting the 79 hours. In the US, 
The average is probably about six and a half hours right now among uh, adults. And of this 40%, about, about three quarters of them have sleep problems that, are, that will either affect the, the quality of their sleep or their daytime performance. So you might ask yourself a question, uh, does monitoring sleep work? And how many of you here are using a device? Uh, this is, um, this is an, uh, an older model of a Fitbit. You're using a device. Do you find it useful? Um, yeah. I find it useful when it shows me that uh, a week has gone by and I'm way below what, I'm, what happened. Yeah. So my question is, would you have already have known that anyways? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> and what about you? I'm still trying to sort out if it's reliable. You know, okay. It's really yeah. Accurate. So there have, there, there have, you know, so these devices have been out for a long time. And believe it or not, there isn't a whole lot of literature that validates their, their use right now. And, and, and it could be that the companies may not even be interested in validating them, that you know, as long as, as the data is sort of fuzzy, you know, people will buy them and, and kind of use them. So uh, there, there are many, many gadgets out there that purport to monitoring your sleep. Some of them sit by the bedside, some of them sit in the bed, and then there are some that are on the wrist. And the ones, and you, you always have to ask yourself, what are they actually monitoring? And in some cases, we're not sure what they're actually monitoring because they're, they're, they're using proprietary systems. Now, this one, um, all of the Fitbits use an accelerometer. In other words, that if there's movement, they assume that the person is awake. And if there's no movement, they assume that the person uh, is more or less asleep. Um, but anyways, we're very early on in the use of these kind of devices to monitor sleep. So uh, daytime sleepiness, not surprisingly, since a large part of the population doesn't sleep enough, enough we have a lot of daytime sleepiness, and it affects all aspects of, of, of our life, including our work. Now, how, how, has anybody here ever pulled an all-nighter where you're up all night? OK, it, it seems like everybody, well, I'm going to say about 70% of the people in, in this room. Pulling an all-nighter is really bad, okay? It's like really bad. And it's really bad um, for the, uh, and it's demonstrated on this slide here. I'll take you through this. So um, we, we have a test um, that's called the psychomotor vigilance task. It's a very simple test. Person sits in front of a screen, there's a light that comes on, person's gotta press the button. It's about as simple a test as, as you can imagine. And there are several of them that, are, that you can download onto your smart devices. So what a PVT lapse is, is that the light comes on and the person does not respond at all. In other words, the lights are on, the eyes are open, but the, but there's no, the person is not responding. So um, in this research, which, which was done at the University of Pennsylvania, they took people and they slept different numbers of days uh, in a very controlled environment. So these guys slept for eight hours a night. They were in bed for eight hours a night. These people were in bed for six hours a night, four hours a night, and these were people all-nighters. So you'll notice that the all-nighters, uh, you know, after one night of not sleeping, already had a lot of lapses. So what that means, basically, is that they had what we call micro-sleeps. When you're asleep, you basically become blind. And you don't see, and you certainly don't respond. And these episodes can be extremely short, which makes them very, very dangerous. So look at someone who only sleeps six hours, OK? Um, so, during the, so here, that person is after about a week. And they're starting to become abnormal. And after about 10 days, they are practically as abnormal as someone who's been up all night. In other words, what they have is a sleep debt that's getting bigger and bigger every night to the point where they now have trouble uh, uh, because they are now physically impaired. Now, the reason why this is important and it's, uh, is that the person who's sleep deprived may actually not have any perception that there is a problem may not have any perception that there's a problem. And I'll give you an interesting uh, example where performance goes down. 
I think some of you have probably participated in, in a hackathon. Okay, so um, I did a, a, a course at Yale, and one of the students in the, a course on sleep, one of the students was a computer science guy, and he did a, a, an, a very simple experiment during a hackathon. And what he looked at, and the participants didn't know this, which, was, which drove me crazy, because it should have gone to an IRB, uh, an institutional review board. What he looked at was the code that the people were writing versus whether they had to be corrected. And what he found is that in the first 12 hours of this hackathon, and it went on for like 24 or more hours, is that the code that was being written in the first 12 hours was OK. But following the 12 hours, all of a sudden, the, the coders were actually correcting code as opposed to writing new code that was, in, that was actually good. So their performance really, really dropped after about 12 hours. And to him, that was kind of a lesson because he was not aware that, you, you know, so if you're up for, you know, for 18 hours coding, you do not have the perception that your abilities have actually dropped. So, so, so that's very important. It's a little bit like, like having a little bit too much alcohol. You may not be aware that you're actually impaired. So cognitive abilities and mood are affected. Memory um, is, is affected if you haven't slept enough. Paying attention to and completing tasks is, 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 is very abnormal. Mood is impaired. People tend to become irritable, snappy, depressed um, when, when they're very, very sleepy. Um, and safety is compromised. And I know uh, um, you know people fall asleep driving, and it's a very, very common problem. I won't go in, in, into a whole lot of details. But one, one of the potential great things about autonomous vehicles is that autonomous vehicles, the software, will not get tired. Okay, Maybe the person who's supposed to be in the car is going to get tired. But the software is going to continue to operate. And so in 10, 20, 30 years, when many of us will probably be sort of sitting in, a, in an automobile uh, that is really driving itself, theoretically, that's safer than the person actually driving, especially if you're driving a very long distance. And this is something that I'm sure that uh, your company or Waymo is working on. So there are health consequences of, of poor sleep, um, body systems associated with ma major diseases such as diabetes are, are affected. Uh, people tend to become overweight. And we know that the immune system doesn't function as well when you're sleep deprived. For example, if you vaccinate someone for influenza and they've been sleep deprived, the response to the vaccine is not as vigorous um, um, uh, when they have been sleep deprived compared to if they've slept normally. Common circadian disorders, shift work. I don't imagine anybody here is an actual shift worker, although I'm guessing many of you control your own hours. Um, shift work is really like jet lag, except it's a lot less fun than going to another place. So when you go to a, when you see your own doctor, when you see your own doctor, ask yourself the question, when was the last time your own doctor asked you anything about sleep? And these are some of the things that the doctor should really explore. Do you snore? Do you or others have, they, has anybody observed you to stop breathing? Uh, do you fall asleep when you shouldn't, watching TV, driving, and so forth? Do you, do you have difficulty sleeping more, th uh, more than three nights a week? Do you have a, a, an unpleasant tingling or creeping sensation in your legs when you're trying to sleep? And are there things that interrupt your sleep? And there's a gazillion things that, that can interrupt your sleep. Um, uh, heartburn, bad dreams, pain, discomfort, noise, you name it. Your dog, your cat, uh, all of these things uh, can interrupt with your sleep. So what do we see at a sleep clinic? And, and I just want to give a, a, a shout out here. Uh, Dr. Rafael P uh, Pleo is here from Stanford, and he's right there. And Stanford, believe it or not, has the, the very first real sleep clinic in the world. Was it Stanford? Was it about 1970? 1970. Yeah, 1970. And it's, 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 it's the sleep clinic in, in the United States. 
And so what do we see in a sleep clinic? What are the complaints that people are coming in with? The number one thing that we see is daytime sleepiness. In other words, somebody falling asleep at the wrong time in the wrong place or unable to focus and concentrate, snoring, insomnia, and I'll cover all of these very briefly in a few minutes, and weird behaviors, and I'll go into some of the weird behaviors in a minute. So what are the diagnoses? Uh, they're listed here, and I'm gonna cover, I'm gonna mention all of these, so don't worry about it, and there won't be a test at the end of this uh, session. So we see it's something called obstructive sleep apnea, where people stop breathing. We see insomnia, difficulty in falling asleep and staying asleep. Restless leg syndrome, where the person can't get comfortable because their legs are driving them crazy as they're trying to sleep. Narcolepsy, a condition usually starting off in the teenage years, resulting in very, very severe sleepiness. And something called REM sleep behavior disorder, where people respond to what they are actually dreaming. So snoring, how many people here uh, snore? Okay, so there's, I don't know, four or five people here um, who are snoring. So snoring is caused by a, by a blockage of breathing when you're sleeping. It's extremely common, uh, about 90 million Americans supposedly snore. It's more common in those who are overweight, have a big neck, a long, thin face, um, and a small jaw. And those are some of the things that contribute to snoring. Now, normally we don't worry a whole lot about snoring unless the snoring is associated with something else or is a symptom of something else. And the main symptom that we worry about is sleep apnea, whoops-a-daisy here. Is sleep apnea. And sleep apnea is extraordinarily common. In this condition, people stop breathing because their upper airway actually obstructs. Uh, it's found in 18 million um, um, Americans, probably 12 million males, 6 million females. And when you stop breathing, your blood oxygen level drops, puts a strain on the heart, raises blood pressure. So all of these bad things are happening when you stop breathing. So it's something that we worry about. This was the old stereotype of someone who had sleep apnea, a, an obese middle-aged gentleman. But we see it in teenagers. Uh, this, these are all patients of mine. You see it in teenagers. You see it in people that have a small lower jaw, for example. And that's actually a very common cause of sleep apnea, both in adults and also in children um, uh, who, who have a, what you might call a big overbite or what we might call an overjet. Um, and, and so that, again, is quite common. So how do we treat sleep apnea? We treat them with a mask that fits over the nose. Uh, this is actually, I can't tell what, yeah, this is a video that's not making any noise. Can you see her, her chest moving? Um, anyway, so, so basically, this is something that we see all the time. Uh, every single clinic that we have, we see one or two or three patients uh, that have this condition. So where are we now? So over the last 30 or 40 years, there have been a big change in our therapy of this condition. The first treatment that we used to use was putting a, a hole in the throat right here. It's called a tracheostomy, which avoided the upper airway breathing passage, and it was very effective, but obviously very, very invasive. And the first patient that I ever had, that's how we treated that patient. Um, and so there have been all of these other technologies that I'm not going to go into, but the most interesting recent one has been hypoglossal nerve stimulation. So the hypoglossal nerve is a nerve that goes to the tongue. And so a couple of years ago, um, uh, a company came out with a system that actually stimulated that nerve. And the, the, the system is based on a pacemaker-like device right here. And one lead that goes down to between the ribs, which indicates uh, it's got a pre pressure transducer that indicates whether or not the person is trying to breathe. And then um, the, the pacemaker says, aha, the guy's trying to breathe. I'm going to push the tongue forward. And that is, in fact, what happens. So there's a sensing of inspiration. The pacer fires. And it stimulates the branch of the hypoglossal nerve and it actually pushes the tongue forward, pushes the tongue forward. So this is a treatment that, that's been in use for a, for a couple of years. 
It was approved by the FDA roughly two years ago, and you're going to hear more and more about it. It doesn't work in someone who's really uh, dramatically overweight, however. So this is how we treat sleep apnea. And I've mentioned all of these before, and I'm going to zip through in, uh, to insomnia. So insomnia is difficulty in falling asleep, awakenings during the night, can't get back to sleep, and also the feeling of I've, I've, I've been in bed all night, I wake up, I feel like I haven't slept. And it's the, the sensation, the perception of inadequate sleep that many people complain about. How common is it? During the course of a year, about 40% of the population will complain about this. However, in only about, not only, this is a lot of people, between 10 and 15% of the American population has insomnia on a chronic basis. So if this were uh, the course that they, that they uh, teach at Stanford and someone in the audience fell asleep, they would be squirted. <laughs> Anyways, they're, 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 I'm not going to do that here. I'm not going to do that here because the students here are not paying to come and listen to me here, so that's fine. So who is at risk of having insomnia, right? So it's women. Women are almost twice as likely to have insomnia as men. Older adults are, again, very likely to have insomnia, and it's partly, it's not just purely age, it's age plus diseases they may have, plus medications that they may be taking that may be causing the problem. And people with a certain mental disorders, for example, depression, are much, much more likely uh, to, to have uh, insomnia. So how do we treat insomnia? Well, sometimes insomnia is actually associated with another condition. And the other condition can be, as I mentioned, depression, chronic obstructive pulmonary disease, arthritis, heart failure. So we almost always will treat that additional condition. There are uh, pharmacologic treatments. The over-the-counter medications are either going to be melatonin and or um, uh, Benadryl type uh, compound, a anti uh, sedating antihistamine. Um, and neither, the over-the-counters are not terrifically effective. Uh, as sleeping pills. And the most commonly used treatment now is behavioral treatment. And, and, I, and I'm not going to go into this except to say that we call it cognitive behavioral therapy. And it's done by psychologists who have additional training. And one of the world's experts um, in, um, in, uh, in cognitive behavioral therapy is at Stanford, um, Dr. Mamber, Rachel Mamber. So restless leg syndrome, an irresistible urge to move the legs when you're sleeping. Anybody here have that? And you have that? OK. Your friend has that. <laughs> OK. OK, so restless leg syndrome um, is, is, is interesting. It's found in probably about 10 to 15% of the population. It can be genetic. It can run in families. Very common in people of a, of a French-Canadian background, uh, for example. And it's a neurological disorder. And um, I don't know whether the video, oh, the video is working. So the lady on the left, OK, the lady on the left, she, her, she feels hot. When we measure the temperature of her legs, they feel perfectly normal. Um, and so it's almost like what we call a neuropathy. There's something that is, she has the perception that there's something abnormal going on. When we uh, take a patient with this complaint and we monitor them during sleep, I don't know if you noticed, but this gentleman had a twitch in his legs about every 20 seconds. Had a twitch in his legs about every 20 seconds. And so that's what people with um, restless leg syndrome do. And it's not a whole lot of fun to be in the same bed with someone who moves a lot like this, um, as you can imagine. So narcolepsy, so narcolepsy is a very common condition in a university setting. Uh, for example, um, at Yale, we have a lot of patients with, with narcolepsy. Why? Because it usually begins in people who are young adults or late teenagers. And the symptom is severe daytime sleepiness. In other words, they're sleepy 100% of the, of the time. And suddenly, they may lose muscle tone and collapse. 
Uh, we call that narcolepsy, and the collapse occurs in response to hearing a joke, becoming angry or excited. And they also will have very vivid dream imagery um, uh, as they're falling asleep or, or even after they've awakened in the morning. Remember I mentioned before that we don't have our first episode of rapid eye movement sleep until 90 minutes. These patients will have uh, dreams actually at the beginning of the night and sometimes before they're actually asleep. So um, it's a chronic disorder. Um, it's an immunological disorder in, in humans. And we're actually fairly good at treating it. We can't cure it, but we can treat it and we can get rid of the symptoms. So, oh, so this is a, a gentleman that has REM sleep behavior disorder. I mentioned before that people are paralyzed during REM sleep and some people are not. Keep looking at this guy up there. He's starting to twitch and he's dreaming. His dreaming is being attacked. So this is a very frightening symptom to anybody who's in the same house as, as this patient. And, and over the years, I've had patients who've been hurt uh, by, by their bed partner who had a dream that they were being attacked and they were therefore uh, attacking the person uh, sleeping uh, next to them. So this uh, condition is common in people with a disease that's called Parkinson's disease. And, and many without Parkinson's disease will develop during the course of their lifetime who have this symptom another uh, what we call neurodegenerative disease, and it can lead to injuries uh, if it's untreated. So sleep problems can be a, a, an important issue, um, and the reason why your doctor needs to ask you about things is that we can treat all of these conditions that I've mentioned, and we're pretty good at treating them. Um, so if anybody here has any symptom, the um, the, the Stanford Sleep Clinic in Redwood City is like world famous, and that's where you ought to be going. So at the sleep center, what do they do? They, they do a test that's called polysomnography, where they measure a bunch of things. Th this can be done either in the lab itself, or you could be sent home with equipment to monitor you at home. There's a, whoops a daisy. So there's a test that is done. Um, that measures daytime sleepiness. So uh, for example, um, if someone is driving a truck or is a pilot who has a condition where there's a concern about whether they can stay awake or not, we could document whether objectively whether they are sleepy. And uh, these are the treatments that are available through, um, through the clinic. So I'm, I'm gonna end by just saying this. Sleep is, is a basic biological need and you need to have it. And you need to have the right amount of it. If you don't sleep enough, there are serious negative consequences. Your doctor should identify if, if you have a sleep problem. And the only way to identify it is for, the, is for he or she to ask you the question or for you to bring it up. And how many people do you know who have a sleep problem and how many of them have been diagnosed? Anybody here have a family member who's being treated for a sleep problem? Okay, it's about uh, three or four of you. Um, any of you know people that probably have a sleep problem that should be treated? Okay, so a whole bunch more hands. Which sort of brings up the point that many people with sleep disorders have not been uh, diagnosed. So I'm gonna end this segment and I'm gonna, we're now gonna be interactive and I, and I think what we're gonna do, um, what we're gonna do is take questions and we'll see how far we can get uh, on with the questions. So most of you have gotten this handout and this handout uh, is from my book which is 13 Commandments for People Who Are Having Trouble With Sleep but I wanna hear from you. I want you to ask me questions and I'll do my best to answer them. I have a question about the mid-afternoon lull. Mm -hmm. Is it known what the function of that is or evolutionary advantage or any recommendations with what we should do when we're experiencing that? Well, the, the, the main, so the, the question is, does the mid-afternoon lull have any function? And the answer is, I don't know if, if it has any positive function or not. But it is there and it's a function of our circadian rhythm. 
And if you feel that you're having an afternoon uh, sort of reduction in, in alertness, probably the smartest thing to do, if it's affecting you, uh, for example, your, your, your work, your concentration, your driving, and, and all of a sudden you're exhausted, the best thing to do is to take a nap of about f uh, anywhere between 15 and 30 minutes, and it'll refresh you. Um, and, and so, but uh, you have to be aware of this mid-afternoon uh, lull because it can really affect your, your performance. The yeah, so I'm going to give the, um, the mic to Dr. Paleo. Just a little speculation on that. The inherent paradox of sleep is that sleeping animals can be attacked while they're sleeping. And our predators are like to attack us at night. So we have a surge of alertness in the evening, and our predators are less likely to attack us in the afternoon. And the temperatures are low. So I think what we're doing is we have a low, so later we have a surge later. So I think it, it complements that. It's just speculation. Following up on that premise, wouldn't that suggest that napping in the afternoon is really the right thing to do from an evolutionary standpoint? Sure, a lot of, a lot of us. Yeah, is. yeah, yes, uh, we agree. Na napping is good. Napping is good. <laughs> napping is really good. A long nap is not good. So if you nap two or three hours, you're going to wake up feeling really groggy because of a phenomenon that's called sleep inertia. So the ideal length of a nap uh, is probably somewhere between 30 and 40 minutes. I, I, uh, I always uh, wake up with uh, an alarm or silent alarm is there are there any guidelines like not to have it fire off in the middle of uh, REM or things like that well there, there there are gadgets that claim that they wake you up during the ideal time um, but in reality they they really unless they're somehow monitoring your brain waves and your eye movements they really don't know whether you're in REM sleep there are several uh, devices that claim to do that um, the, the, the data suggests that if you wake up from very deep sleep, um, you're going to wake up feeling groggy. And probably the best thing to wake up from is rapid eye movement sleep or a lighter stage of sleep. But you'll only have very deep sleep, usually in the first third of the night, unless you're, sleep, uh, unless you're sleeping like a cat, two or three hours here, two or three hours there, and so forth. I see. So basically, just uh, there's nothing that I can do to predict it, like seven and a half hours or something like that. Well, I mean, the ideal thing uh, is uh, the ideal way to know whether you're getting enough sleep is how do you feel during when you wake up and how do you feel uh, during the day. If you wake up feeling good, wide awake, and alert, you've you know you have gotten enough sleep. So I did have a period where I was sleeping uh, regularly very uh, little, like three and a half, four hours. Mm -hmm. And now I, you know, switched, you know, but I don't feel any difference, to be honest, just because uh, people told me it's unhealthy and it dates way back to, to military time. Mm -hmm. So why am I not feeling different? And is it possible that some people can get away with it is possible uh, and stay that's, healthy. I mean, yeah. I'm doing it just because of what I read, what I hear, yeah. not because so, I felt uh, groggy. It, it is possible that three or four hours of sleep out of 24 is okay, but I don't want you to be flying my airplane. Um, in other words, that that for the average person, three to four hours is simply not enough, and they're impaired, and they may not be aware that they are impaired. So that's, that's what the, the big um, concern is from a public health uh, per perspective. So, yeah. so question to follow up on that. Um, what could any of us do to bridge the gap between our, our subjective feeling of whether we're performing well and knowing whether we're actually performing well? So I might feel okay in the afternoon, but I can't measure a 20% yeah, yeah. dip in my performance, just how Strangely I feel. Strangely enough, other people in your home can probably tell when you're sleep deprived. And sometimes asking those people or asking even colleagues, or you know, how am I doing? Do you think I've slept enough may actually give you um, additional useful um, information. If you wanted to try to get objective information, you can actually download one of the apps um, that I mentioned that where you can actually measure your own reaction time and you could see how you compare to, you know, to a, a very big 
population, but other people can usually tell when you're really tired. And, and this is something that we see in a hospital setting all the time. So when, I'm in, uh, you know, when I've in, attended an internal medicine and we're making rounds in the morning, there's been someone who's been awake all night and the, the, the day before uh, you know, taking care of patients. And, and very often, they may not perceive that they're doing anything abnormal, but the other people in the group can tell that the person is, doesn't remember things, is making mistakes. So it's always good to have other people around to sort of um, be there to kind of let you know whether you're, you're uh, performing well. And the chance that we do have to pull an all-nighter or you know, maybe even get three, four hours of sleep a night, what is the best way to recover from that? Is it to add like one additional hour for the rest of the week or we try to get 14 hours of sleep the next night to recover? Or? I think that's a very personal thing. And I know that for myself, if I've lost a lot of sleep in a given night, let's say I'm going overseas or something and I'm on one of these six hour flights and you're a, you, know, you only get to sleep like four or something like that. I find that the next day, um, getting a really long night of sleep, starting at the bedtime of my destination is the best thing that I can do. And very often when I do that, I will sleep 10, 11, maybe even 12 hours uh, during that night. So it's a very, very personal thing. If, if, if catching up is an extra hour, but that extra hour still doesn't put you into the normal range, you're not gonna correct. So you have to make sure that the, that the sleep that you're actually getting is going to correct your sleep deprivation. Okay. Snor snoring, sleep apnea, restless leg syndrome are all true. Insomnia is not there. Oh, there I, sh I, I should put insomnia. We, we can treat insomnia. Okay. Uh, we can treat in, in, insomnia. I'll, I'll have to make that correction. And the way we treat insomnia is what I mentioned uh, is the first thing we do is what we call cognitive behavioral therapy and sleep hygiene, which is some of the stuff that's on the sheet um, uh, uh, um, that was actually handed out. And, um, and the, so giving sleeping pills is not the first thing that we do when someone has an insomnia. It's the last thing that we do when someone has insomnia. We wanna make sure that we cover um, any comorbidity or any other disease that they may have and we've corrected their sleep hygiene, and we've done what we call cognitive behavioral therapy. So um, I sleep maybe like four or five hours and wake up naturally after mm -hmm. that. Like I'll go to sleep at 10, I'll naturally just wake up at <laughs> two or three in the morning. I'll go to sleep at midnight, I'll naturally wake up four to five. So you sleep four out of 24? Four, four to five hours out of 24, yeah. Yeah, I mean, there Is are that, a lot, there are people. Natural, like I don't set an alarm, it just, I just wake it, up. Yeah. Uh, there are people that can get away with that. And uh, get getting away may not be the right term. There are some people who naturally seem to function on a small amount of sleep. And, and the only way to sort of know whether you might need more sleep is for you to participate in one of these research studies where they keep you in a bed. And, and if you fall asleep over and above the four hours, that's going to tell me, because the only way you fall asleep is, is if you need sleep. If you don't need to sleep, you will never fall asleep. In other words, if you're wide awake and alert, it just isn't going to happen. So that's why that study that I showed you from the University of, of Pennsylvania was so interesting in, 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 in that when you force people to stay in a bed, they actually will sleep if they're sleep deprived. Uh, my wife is a nurse and she works nights for the last yeah. eight months and it's been a train wreck, so this is all kind of close to home. Um, so she goes to sleep and sleeps four or five hours as well and wakes up naturally and can't fall back asleep. Yeah. So that's usually between one and two o'clock. And then we have small children, so she'll sleep again between like 7.30 and 10. Yeah. And that's the rhythm she's been following. And there's some other things we've been doing, but yeah. it doesn't seem to be working. Yeah, so it, it, it's a very tough problem. And one of the things you might consider well, there's two things to consider in that kind of situation. Number one is, is to seek help from a sleep disorder center where they're used to dealing with this kind of thing. And number two, and what I advise people, is see if you can get a permanent day job. There are some people who just can't adapt to unusual, not unusual, to, to schedules that are not in sync 
with their own circadian clock. There are many people who are night people. Um, and for example, if you look at people in the entertainment business, right, these are people who they go to bed two, three, four o'clock in, in the morning. They love it. They wake up 10, 11 in the morning, noon. And so that's their natural rhythm. So what I advise people is try to find a job that is in sync with your natural rhythm and you're going to feel a lot better. And depending on, on you know, your family circumstances, that may or may not be practical. But in the long run, uh, it's something that I recommend. And I recommend it for a couple of reasons. Um, uh, besides the fact it can acutely cause problems, chronically, I've seen a lot of uh, patients who are nurses who've worked for 30, 40 years. And they've had these terrible shifts. And once they retire, many of them will, will be under the impression that all their sleep problems are going to go away, and they don't. So, so that's something else to consider is the long-term um, implications of, of working nights. And there's a lot of data coming out that working nights may not be good for overall health besides sort of cognitive functioning. Also, your book was just released last week. It was a, released a week ago today. Yeah, and what, what's the name of it? So, the, the name of the book is The Mystery of Sleep, no. and, and the purpose of the book is to arm people with information that if they or somebody in their family has a sleep problem, that what they need to do. Mm -hmm. And the most important thing that people need to do is to make sleep a priority. In other words, that you shouldn't ignore it, you shouldn't denigrate it, don't aim for sleeping two or three hours like a lot of people do. Um, make sleep a priority in your life and you'll feel a lot better and be healthier. Right. Great. Well, and, uh, join me in thanking you for being here today and sharing some of that knowledge with us here at Google. It was great. Thank you.